get started. So uh, we're not going to go over time too much. So uh, this afternoon I will talk about membranes. Membranes, uh, mainly uh, we'll talk about membrane structures and uh, a little bit of function. Um, so what are, what are membranes? Well, membranes participate in many aspects of cell structure and function and the plasma membrane uh, basically defines the cell and it separates inside from the outside. The membranes also define the intracellular organelles, for example the nucleus that we just heard about, or the mitochondria, or the lysosomes. And these biomembranes all have the same basic architecture, namely it's a phospholipid bilayer. And uh, uh, so uh, that should not lead you to believe that they are all static and that they are all the same. Uh, but their function uh, uh, is not really to uh, prevent all exchange across that border, namely the membrane, uh, but rather each cellular membrane has its own set of proteins and also in a way its own set of lipids and it allows it to uh, carry out uh, a number of different functions. And so membranes basically form these uh, different compartments. And the plasma membrane, you can also hear the term plasma lemma. Uh, again, it's a, a bilayer boundary made up of these lipids uh, and also of uh, proteins. And it's basically a boundary between the cell and the outside world. And it's crucial uh, because it's uh, affecting most or almost all cellular functions, especially the exchange of material across the membrane. And these membranes are selectively permeable, meaning they only allow a certain number uh, or a certain set of molecules or specific particles to get across the membrane into the cell. Uh, um, so for example, the lipid bilayer is freely permeable to some small lipid soluble molecules, if they are non-polar, but it is completely impermeable, or pretty much impermeable to some of the charged ions, for example, sodium, potassium, and so on. So um, how do membranes actually come into existence or into, into place? How do they grow? Well, it turns out membranes uh, really grow through enlargement of pre-existing membranes. So basically whatever you have in terms of a membrane, that just gets enlarged and, and, and uh, is passed on. And it is the composition of these membranes that gives them their characteristics. So basically what kind of proteins you have um, and so on. And so, but how do how, how membranes build? Uh, how can you actually add something to an existing membrane? Well, you can get lipids from the cytosol in the cell. Uh, and then you can also incorporate some proteins uh, proteins are made, obviously, you can add them, you can synthesize some proteins, and then you can also add some carbohydrates, uh, that typically occurs in the Golgi apparatus, right? So you can modify uh, and basically add to, uh, to an existing membrane. And then these membranes, they can flow between organelles, you basically can add membrane, you can modify, you can take away some membrane, uh, and not surprisingly then that causes the consecutive or subsequent membranes to differ from, from the first ones. So when we look at membranes, we really talk about there's a membrane and there's a watery or an aqueous environment on, on either side of the two. And these aqueous environments, they are different on each side of the membrane. And the membrane really serves to maintain this difference of, the, uh, of these aqueous environments in terms of ionic concentration, in terms of ionic composition, uh, and so on. So, um, as you just heard in the previous lecture, we, we don't really just find membranes <coughs> that form the border of a cell. Um, we actually find them even within, uh, within cells. They form compartments with unique properties. So around, around the cell here, around the nucleus, around the ER, around the Golgi, around some vesicles, and so they all have they all have membranes. And so here you see a uh, transmission electron micrograph, uh, so that was obtained with a transmission electron microscope. 
very high power. And, and you've probably all seen images like this here, for example, is a roughly R uh, uh, ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, here's some mitochondria, here's some smoothia. Over here is a nice Golgi apparatus. Here are some, uh, here's some more mitochondria. Here's a so called peroxisome. It has this, this vesicle, this, this dark spot. So um, they all have membranes around them. Here are some other examples of mitochondria, graphia, smoothia. Here again is the nucleus. And here's the, the plasma membrane. Um, so when you have a plasma membrane, uh, and you have several cells, you actually have two plasma membranes, right? It's not that, that you just have one, uh, you actually have two membranes uh, next to each other. So here you have cell one and cell two, and each cell is uh, surrounded or defined by a phospholipid bilayer. And so that's basically what we see here. So you see these two railway tracks, not just one, you actually see two of these. Um, uh, first of the divider. How uh, thick is a membrane? Well, it's about 7.5 nanometers thick, not 7.5 microns or picometer, but 7.5 uh, nanometers. Now, you might hear this term unit membrane, and it's, it's somewhat outdated uh, because initially people thought, well, oh, all the membranes are made up of these lipid phospho bilayers, so they are all kind of the same thing, and therefore people call them it's sort of like a unit membrane. It's the same unit everywhere. But people realize over time that all oh, these membranes are all very different. Yes, they are sort of the basic organization is the same, but each membrane can be different from the next one. So not only is the environment different on the inside and the outside of the cell. Also, the plasma membrane itself is different uh, on the side that faces the outside, the extracellular or the exoplasmic side, versus the cellular or the, or the cytoplasmic side. And so basically, these two layers of the lipid bilayer are distinctly different from each other. And so, all biological membranes have these two sides, these two leaflets, and we refer to them again as a, a cytoplasmic leaflet or the nucleoplasmic leaflet. We uh, show it as a dash line. And then we have the exoplasmic uh, leaflet, uh, here shown by the solid line. And uh, again, uh, all of these organelles also have, have membranes. So uh, this uh, uh, this brings us to the fact that um, the membrane is made up of lipids and proteins. And so the first thing that we want to talk about are actually the membrane lipids that make up the phospholipid bilayer. And these membrane lipids, they are amphiphilic. And that means they have a hydrophilic component and a hydrophobic component, so they basically as both, one that fears water, the hydrophobic one, and the hydrophilic one loves water. So they're amphiphilic. And so basically what you have then here is these long aliphatic chains of fatty acids, and they're very hydrophobic. Uh, and then um, you have uh, carboxyl groups of these fatty acids. You have some glycerol here. And then you have some head groups, and these head groups, they are typically hydro, uh, hydrophilic, as opposed to the hydrophobic long fatty acid chains. So in these polar heads, uh, there can be all sorts of things. I mean, there can be a, a choline, ethanolamine, serine. Um, those are all called the phospholipids. So you basically have this phosphate group in between here. So basically the polar head, phosphate, glycerol, and then the fatty acid chains. Uh, or you can have a carbohydrate chain there uh, as, a, as a polar head. And depending on what you have, you either call them phospholipids if they have a phosphate, or you call them glycolipids if they have this carbohydrate or this, this sugar coat there. 
uh, on the outside. So uh, there are some other terms that you might uh, come across. Uh, some of these phospholipids and all of the glycolipids are spingiolipids. And spingiolipids, they're derived from an amino alcohol, namely spingiosin. Um, and they contain these long fatty acid chains um, uh, attached to a spingiosine amine group. Um, but they all have uh, all of these uh, um, lipids, uh, plus all these, these lipids here, have the glycerol, and that's bound to these fatty acids. Um, and so basically, um, you have the glycerol and the glycerides. Okay, so uh, so that's how the how the lipids are uh, are made up. And uh, if you do an experiment and you take some phospholipids, for example, or also some glycolipids, and you and you throw them uh, and you throw them in water, then spontaneously they develop a lipid bilayer or bilayer membrane. And the reason for that is that the hydrophobic portions here in the center, they want to stay away from the water, so they basically all uh, face each other. Uh, and, the, and the hydrophilic portions then face the, face the aqueous solution, or face the water. Now, uh, it turns out that in, uh, in uh, biological membranes, when we look at cells, it turns out that the exoplasmic leaflet and the cytoplasmic leaflet are different. So they are not the same, they're not some mirror image, but rather there's some asymmetry in the cellular membrane such that specific lipids only occur on the cytoplasmic side and others occur only on the exoplasmic side. So here, for example, and you're gonna see the abbreviations on, on the next slide, here there's, for example, phosphatidylcholine, um, spingomyelin, all these glycolipids, they occur on the exoplasmic side, and then there's something like phosphatidylethanol, I mean, phosphatidylserine that you find on the cytoplasmic side. So you have a distinct asymmetry in these, in these cells, in the lipid bilayer of, of uh, biological cells. Now, how do we know all of that? How do we actually see um, membranes? Well, there's a couple of techniques to look at membranes and also to look at the interior of membranes. Uh, one technique is called freeze fracture uh, microscopy or freeze fracture examination. And so basically what people do there, they, they, uh, they uh, freeze the tissue. Um, you basically uh, freeze the tissue and rapidly freeze the cells and then they are ruptured and basically when they rupture then the membranes split open and they expose the interior uh, surface and then you can cover these, these exposed surfaces with some uh, metal for example a layer of uh, platinum or so and then you can actually look at them in an electron microscope and then you get a good idea of what the, what the cells actually uh, what the cells actually look like. And that helped people to understand that there is this asymmetry in the, in the uh, uh, lipid bilayer. So, as I said, the abbreviations of those uh, lipids are shown here. So the C leaflet has phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine, the exoplasmic leaflet has uh, phosphatidylcholin, spingomyelin, and all the glycolipids are on the exoplasmic side. So basically, what that means is you have uh, something like a sugar coat on the ex on the on the outside uh, of the cell. Now, why is this why is this uh, uh, relevant, or why is this asymmetry relevant? Well, the asymmetry indicates that the cells are intact and and functional. Uh, and what can happen is that when cells get old, for example, when red blood cells get old and they need to be taken out of circulation, they can actually lose that uh, membrane asymmetry. And there's a specific enzyme uh, known as the scramblase 
this is scrambles up the membrane lipids. And what it does is that it can actually move that phosphatidyl serine that is supposed to be on the cytoplasmic leaflet. It can actually move that into the exoplasmic leaflet. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's a signal for macrophages that this is an old red blood cell and it needs to be taken out of circulation. So the macrophages come uh, and, they, and they eat it up. And that typically happens in one of our uh, lymphatic organs, uh, specifically the spleen. So scramblase is an enzyme that actually allows lipids to move from one leaflet to the other. Because principally, these, uh, these um, lipids, they cannot move easily from one side to the other. They can move in the plane of their respective leaflet, but they cannot flip to the other side or flop, flip flop uh, to the other side. So these flip flops are relatively rare, and when that scramblase enzyme comes in, it can actually do that. It can actually flip the lipid to the other side. Now, there are actually other enzymes that also do that, and not surprisingly, they're referred to as flip cases and flop cases, um, and they require uh, energy, and um, they, they can actually do that, but um, a, uh, a flip-flop doesn't typically occur spontaneously. That's, that's fairly rare. And, and again, when it occurs, that can be a signal for, uh, for the macrophages to eat up uh, that cell, uh, if it's a red blood cell, for example. So, um, so again, uh, you know, these flip-flops are rare. So, uh, um, Professor? Yes. Uh, can you uh, please explain about what you mean by flip-flop? Do you like switching sides? Yes, actually, so, so the question was, what's a, what's a flip-flop? So basically you have your two lipid bilayers, uh, or leaflets, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, you have lipids here and you have lipids here, right? And um, they basically stay in position like that. They can move in the, in the, in the they can move laterally um, in that leaflet, but they cannot flip to, to the other leaflet. That doesn't typically, and so that's basically a flip-flop if you, if you sort of move from one side uh, from one leaflet to the other. That's, I mean, even if you think about it, that's kind of a difficult thing, right? How would you actually do that? I mean, the, the lipids can all move laterally, right? I mean, there's basically tons of lipids and they just move around all the time. But that's not a problem, that's relatively, I mean, that's kind of normal. But that, that a lipid flips to the other side, that's a very rare event. That's, that's what's called a flip-flop. Oh, that's what we refer to as a flip-flop, and you need specific enzymes that, that actually do that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so one of the, uh, one of the uh, lipids is actually uh, cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol, sterol, uh, makes up anywhere between 20 to 40 percent of the, of the plasma membrane. Um, and Cholesterol is actually unusual because cholesterol can actually flip uh, between one and the other leaflet. So that's sort of unusual about, about it. And it, it is a relatively small, um, small molecule. It has a small polar group. If it had a large polar group, that would make it more difficult to get in the membrane. But with a small polar group, it can do that. It has a large non-polar region, and so it can move in the plane of a leaflet, but it can also move basically from one leaflet uh, to the other. Now, what does, uh, what does cholesterol do actually to the membrane? It actually decreases the membrane permeability to small molecules, for example, water. So basically, if you have a lot of cholesterol built in here, that makes it more difficult for other molecules to move across the membrane. Uh, water uh, is, a, is an example. All right, so now we have talked about membrane lipids. So now we actually talk about membrane proteins. And uh, so what do membrane proteins do? Well, 
They can do a lot of things. They can be involved in signaling across the membrane. They can be involved in transporting things across the membrane. Uh, they can be involved in cell adhesion, so cells sticking together. together. Uh, what kind of proteins do we actually have in the membrane? Uh, well, um, there are those proteins that actually cross the entire membrane. Um, they are referred to as integral membrane proteins or integral proteins. Um, and, and they often, or well, they can either just go across the membrane once, like this one here in green. Uh, that's like a single, single pass transmembrane protein. So it passes across the membrane just once. But there's others that cross the membrane several times. Um, and if you, if, you, if you ever heard about G protein coupled receptors, the, the G protein coupled receptor, they actually cross the membrane seven times. They go across um, yeah, seven times. Um, so those are the integral uh, proteins. Uh, and then there's also some proteins that basically just stick to the, to the surface of the <coughs> peripheral. And there's some that stick to the outside, to the exoplasmic side, and then there's others that you find here on the cytoplasmic side. So those would be, in either case, they would be um, peripheral uh, proteins. So we have integral or transmembrane proteins versus um, peripheral proteins. And these peripheral proteins, they are basically held onto the membrane by some weak electrostatic forces, they don't really go into the hypophobic core here of the phospholipids. And instead, they are bound to the membrane either indirectly by interacting with an integral membrane protein or they are anchored somehow to a lipid um, and interact with the, with the lipid head group. So, let's start to take a look at those membrane proteins and initially we're going to uh, look at these ones, the, the single pass transmembrane proteins. And so this is what it looks like. Here's a very reductionist, a very reduced membrane where you just have two lines, one line indicating the exoplasmic leaflet and the other line indicating the cytoplasmic leaflet. And so here you have a, a protein, you basically have an amino acid chain that goes through the membrane just once and then here you have some polar polar head groups, so again here's the bilayer, here's the polypeptide, and then here you, you, in this case, you have a carbohydrate, and as I said earlier, that quote unquote sugar coat, that carbohydrate, is, is always found on the, on the exoplasmic side. So the function of these proteins um, can be varied. Uh, there are receptors, there can be receptors, for example, for a, uh, a molecule called NOTCH, uh, and they can also be a receptor for a, uh, for a ligand that's referred to as delta. Um, this, these uh, proteins uh, can be involved in cell recognition and also in cell attachment, so they can have a different number of different, uh, different functions. Now, NOTCH, NOTCH is kind of unusual, NOTCH and delta are kind of unusual because what happens with NOTCH um, uh, it's a protein that is expressed uh, specifically early in development in epithelial cells and, and uh, it interacts with another single pass transmembrane protein, namely delta, and um, they interact with each other um, and it determines whether that cell stays in the epithelial cell or becomes a nerve cell. So what you see here is that both notch and its ligand, the delta, so this you have, you have notch here and the, and the ligand is delta, and, and the ligand is also a single pass transmembrane protein, but it's on another cell, right? So you have notch on one cell, uh, and you have the ligand on another cell, and when the ligand binds to notch, when this delta binds to notch, then the external part of that transmembrane protein is actually cut off, uh, and uh, uh, it's bound to, uh, to delta. And then 
both not get sort of taken into itself and delta is the external part of notch is also taken into this, its own cell and then the cell that is the, the remnant of notch stays in the epithelial cell and the other one becomes a, a nerve cell. So, but the main message here is that these are single pass transmembrane proteins as an example uh, of those. Here's another example of a single pass transmembrane protein that is for the epidermal growth factor that's involved in tyrosine kinase signaling. Do you, you, you know what a kinase is? What's a kin what is a kinase? Phosphorylase? Yeah, it phosphorylates, right? And what's so, so the kinase phosphorylates, what enzyme takes the phosphate away? Phosphatase, right? So you have kinase. So, so in this case, um, this this epidermal growth factor receptor uh, is involved in, uh, in tyrosine kinase signaling, so it's phosph phosphor phosphorylating tyrosine. So what happens here, again here, you have two of these um, single pass transmembrane proteins, they sort of come together, they form a dimer, so here you have the EGF binding to the receptor, the receptors form this dimer, there's some cross phosphorylation um, going on at their cytoplasmic tails, and it basically activates their tyrosine kinase domains. And what that means, they then can phosphorylate some other proteins, and that then eventually leads to uh, cell proliferation, therefore, this name epidermal growth factor. So, again, these are single pass transmembrane uh, proteins. Now let's talk about some other proteins that go through the membrane several times, as you see here, right? So again, here's the bilayer, here's the polypeptide, and you can see how the, how the polypeptide goes through the membrane several times, and again, there's a carbohydrate here uh, at this end. Uh, what's the function of them? Well, they can be, for example, these uh, G-protein coupled receptors, except those wouldn't have four, they would actually go through the membrane seven times. Um, they can also be transport proteins, so they could form a pore, and, and through that pore you could let uh, certain ions into the cell, for example, sodium uh, or calcium or so. Um, and they can also form, have you heard of uh, uh, connexin, connexin hemijunctions, connexin or gap junctions, have you heard of gap junctions? Um, they can form these, uh, these, these channels between um, uh, cells and they can form iron pumps. They can also form glucose transporters. A prominent example, but by far not the only one, uh, of a multipass transmembrane protein is the acetylcholine receptor, specifically the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. When we have do you know where we have acetylcholine receptors? Sorry? On the what? On sorry, on the neural cells. Uh, well, we can have acetylcholine receptor on nerve cells or on neural cells. Where else do we find acetylcholine receptors? On muscle cells, right? Specifically, skeletal muscle cells, right? So nicotinic, we also have um, acetylcholine receptors on heart muscle, but that's a different type, that's a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. So what does the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor look like? Well, uh, it's actually made up of five different proteins. Um, so you have several subunits, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, two yeah. alpha subunits. And, but if you look at an individual subunit, here the beta subunit is shown, and this white line basically shows this polypeptide that goes across the membrane four times, right? So that's one of those uh, multipass transmembrane proteins. And when you have several of those and you put those together, they form, that's basically a hole in the center, that's a pore uh, for for ions to get through. That's why it's called uh, an ion channel, right? Now, typically the ion channel is blocked, but when 
the alpha subunits bind uh, acetylcholine, then specifically two acetylcholine uh, molecules, then the channel opens up and you can have sodium rushing into the uh, skeletal muscle cell and then the muscle uh, will contract. So that's an example of a uh, um, uh, uh, transmembrane uh, uh, protein, a large multipass transmembrane uh, protein. The next example of, uh, of uh, proteins are the so-called glycosyl-phosphatidyl inositol anchor proteins. And so what does that look like? Again, we have the bilayer, uh, we have a glycosyl-phosphatidyl uh, um, inositol, so we basically have sort of like a, a, a sugar here, we have a polypeptide out here, that's sort of like our uh, our protein here is sort of the, the phosphatidyl inositol, um, and, and that's anchored uh, into the cell. So these proteins, they are bound covalently to one or more lipid molecules. So that basically means they share the electron pairs between the atoms, and that's sort of how they hold on to on there. And the hydrophobic segment of the attached lipid is embedded in the leaflet uh, of the membrane and therefore it can anchor the protein to the membrane. But the polypeptide itself does not enter the phospholipid bilayer. And so that's basically what you see here. Um, and so what's their function? Uh, so again, here's the uh, phosphatidyl inositol and that's the, this entire thing that is called the glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol. Function, they can be receptors or they can be enzymes, that's basically where they are. The location is always on the exoplasmic side. So, as an example, uh, alkaline phosphatase is a GPI linked protein. Uh, again, you just told me what a phosphatase does, right? It, it uh, takes a phosphate group away from something, and so we find it actually in the membranes of osteoblasts. Uh, what are osteoblasts? Osteoblast is a cell type that you find in bones. Bones have basically three, three cell types. They're called osteoblast, osteocyte, and osteoclast. And the osteoblast, those are the bone forming cells. The osteocytes are the bone cells themselves. And the osteoclasts are the cells that actually break down the bone. So here you find um, osteo, uh, you find that alkaline phosphatase in these osteoblast membranes, and basically what it does, it increases the local concentration of free phosphate, so you can build, uh, you, can put, you can put calcium phosphate into your bone. So, uh, so, so that's one of those GPI link proteins. Another example of proteins um, in the membrane are these proteins that are covalently bound uh, to lipid. There's basically another type of a lipid anchored protein. And so several types of covalently attached lipids uh, anchor some water-soluble proteins uh, to one or the other leaflet of the plasma membrane. And so in these, in these lipid-anchored proteins, the lipid hydrocarbon chain uh, is embedded in the bilayer, but the protein itself does not enter the bilayer. And so uh, you uh, can basically uh, find them primarily on the cytoplasmic side and so these anchors used to insert the proteins at the cytosolic phase and they are not used on the exoplasmic uh, phase. Shown uh, here, there's a polypeptide, here's the lipid, so uh, it's covalently bound to a lipid and again the function can be receptor related uh, signaling here would be the receptor. So, so here, um, if, if you uh, if this would be a, 
GPA uh, binding uh, receptor or G protein uh, G protein coupled receptor where the GTP binding protein would be here. Here's the ligand, here's the receptor, here's the GTP binding protein, um, and uh, it's attached to the membrane through this uh, covalent bond, uh, bond to the to the lip. So, uh, so yeah, so typically the, the, the messenger uh, the signaling cascade is the ligand binds to the receptor, then the receptor interacts with this protein, and then the protein uh, would split up into its subunit, and they then would uh, trigger an intracellular messenger cascade. So we find them always on the C side, and examples are SARC and RAS. Uh, SARC and RAS are, are these lipid linked signaling proteins. They stimulate cell proliferation. That's what they do, but they are, if there are mutations in these two, then they actually uh, become uh, oncogenic. So RAS is one of those GTP binding proteins. Um, uh, it's anchored to, to the membrane. Uh, it functions in intracellular signaling, um, and it's recruited to the cytosolic side through this, through this anchor, through this lipid anchor. SAR is a tyrosine kinase, meaning it, it phosphorylates tyrosine residence. Okay, so, so that's basically all we say about, or we can talk a little more about proteins, but you get an idea, uh, uh, even more, that there's a really strong membrane asymmetry in place. So we talked earlier about the C leaflet having specific uh, lipids, and now you also know there's certain proteins that you only find on the C side. And then on the exoplasmic side, we find other lipids uh, and all the glycolipids, right? And we find specific proteins that you only find on the uh, on the uh, um, exoplasmic side. So um, briefly, uh, as an example of a peripheral membrane protein, uh, I want to talk about another one. So that's a protein that's bound to the membrane by ionic bonds. So basically, um, it's uh, it's shown here. You have a uh, uh, so you you have a single pass protein, but then that's connected to another protein through these ionic bonds. That's why you see the plus and minus signs there, right? So, so basically you have a uh, single, uh, you have a protein, and that protein then uh, is connected to another protein, which we then would say, well, that's a peripheral protein. This is a single pass protein, goes through the membrane, but this definitely is just a peripheral protein that doesn't go into the membrane at all. Uh, what could those molecules or those proteins do? Well, what they actually do is they can hold on to other structures um, that uh, need to be close to the cell membrane. Uh, well, in, uh, in a good example here, uh, you, would, you would see, okay, there's this peripheral protein that's hanging on or that's holding on to another structure that could be, for example, actin filaments, right, in, in muscle cells. Um, and so uh, that's very important that there's something at the, at the membrane that can hold on to these structures. Location, you can have it both on the cytoplasmic or the exoplasmic side. And an example of such a protein that anchors actin filaments is the uh, protein dystrophin. So dystrophin anchors actin filaments in skeletal muscle cells uh, and it does so by, by being connected to a complex of proteins in the, in the cell membrane itself. And you might have heard about Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. That's basically when this dystrophin protein is defective and you can't really hold on to the actin filament. All right, so now we talked earlier about the uh, about the flip flops uh, of the uh, of the lipids and how rare they are. Um, 
proteins are also somewhat limited in, in where they can move. And so, um, again, it's fairly easy to for proteins as well as the lipids to move laterally or in the plane of their leaflet or in the plane of the membrane. But here, for example, we are dealing with some epithelial cells. And the epithelial cells have these tight junctions. So they're really, they're, they're really, as the name suggests, they're junctions that are very tight, so nothing gets past here. And so proteins, they can move up here, and this is the, the apical side, the apical portion of the cell, and down here is the basolateral side of the cell. So the proteins, uh, and also the, uh, the lipids really, can move here uh, in, this, in this plane, but they can never get down to the basal portion or the basolateral portion of the cell because you have these tight junctions. So if you want to, you need specific proteins here in the apical side on the, in the, you know, the, the side that faces the outside world, then um, you can insert them into the membrane there and they, and they will never get down here. And so um, this diffusion, this lateral diffusion uh, does take place, but it can be prevented or reduced at least if you have some specific anchors. So you can have these membrane proteins, or you could, for example, have dystrophin, right? If you have dystrophin there, that will anchor the actin filaments and will anchor, sort of interact with the membrane proteins, and they are, and they're not moving anywhere. Or down here, uh, you, can, you might have a situation where you have proteins that are hooked up with some or connected to some collagen molecules, so they wouldn't be moving away. Or you have these cell junctions, and basically that prevents any of these proteins uh, from uh, uh, from getting down here to the basal side of the cell. So even though there is a lot of mobility, um, that can be reduced to, to a certain extent. So I mentioned earlier, and I've repeated it a couple of times, that there can be these carbohydrate coats on the on both the lipids as well as on the on the proteins, and uh, uh, we find that typically on the exoplasmic side. So basically, if you think about it, that means that the outside of the cell has these carbohydrates, basically these sugars, uh, uh, on it. And there's a term for that, and the term is glycocalyx. So calyx is like a cover or a shield, and glycos is like a, a sugar, sugar cover, a sugar shield uh, on the outer surface of the plasma membrane. And that's kind of important. Uh, it has a number of different functions. Um, one is it protects the proteins from being broken down, so it prevents them from proteolysis. But it also helps cells to attach to uh, substrates or to other cells. And it also uh, helps with cell recognition. For example, our blood groups are glycolipids. So, so they have a, these carbohydrates have a distinct function. However, uh, on the negative side, uh, some toxins and viruses recognize and bind to specific glycolipids uh, on epithelial cells in the GI tract. And that actually helps them to get into, into the cell. So they actually seek out these, these uh, uh, carbohydrate codes. So what does a glycocalyx actually look like? Here's a, a schematic version, so again here, in gray are the two leaflets of the lipid bilayer. Uh, here you have some glycolipids. Here you have glyco, uh, glycoproteins uh, as transmembrane proteins or as a peripheral protein. And so here again is the cell code, the, the glycocalyx, so the carbohydrates. What does it look like in an electron micrograph? Well, here you have actually two cells. Here's their membrane, right? Uh, here's a specific junction um, that, that um, uh, is so-called zonular occludes, that basically occludes anything 
And then, so this would be, this would basically be the outside of that tissue or the outside of those cells. And you can see there's this fuzzy material in here that's basically glycocalyx that you find uh, on, the out, on the exoplasmic or on the outside surface. And again, serves in cell recognition, can have some enzymatic activity, uh, but it can also have receptors for antibodies, hormones, bacteria, and viruses. So if there is a uh, message, a sort of a take home message from the lecture, then it is that plasma membranes are not homogeneous, right? They can have different kinds of proteins, they can be different kinds of lipids. Each side, each leaflet is different from the other leaflets, so they're not homogeneous uh, at all. And, and not surprisingly, they have very uh, different functions, or can have very uh, different functions. So, uh, what, what we ha uh, have then is, so if you think uh, uh, of a membrane being sort of like, uh, like an ocean, um, it turns out that in that ocean there are little islands that are referred to as lipid rafts. And these lipid rafts, these islands, are little, little domains, micro domains, and they can be enriched in specific lipids or in specific membrane proteins, for example, in cholesterol or spindulipids. And these islands, uh, well, not only an island is flat, but they can actually also occur like a little volcano, like a little pocket. Um, that's referred to as a caviole or caviola. And why, why are these lipid rafts relevant? Uh, what's important? So imagine again, you have you, you, you want to get into the ocean and you actually go onto an, one of these little islands, one of these little lipid rafts, and that helps you to get into uh, this under, under the water. Um, so um, these membrane proteins that can be involved in signal transduction into the cell and they're concentrated heavily in these, in these lipid rafts. So here's a, here's a, a, a diagram of that. So again, if you have this membrane here and certain spots of the membrane have specific proteins or specific lipids are, and are specifically enriched in these lipids and proteins and that then helps uh, viruses, for example, or other things to get into the cell or there's some transduction going on, meaning there's some signal that's being conveyed from the outside to the inside. So again, these can be flat or they can form these cavioli. Uh, here's a caviola and there's a specific protein, caviolin, that, that helps these uh, lipid rafts to form this flask, or to assume this flask-like uh, shape. And so again, as I said, many signaling molecules and receptors are concentrated in lipid rafts and, uh, and, and cavioli. Now, um, you know, again, uh, the plasma membranes are not homogeneous, uh, rather, uh, they can be enriched in specific uh, receptors or specific proteins, generally or specific uh, uh, lipids. For example, insulin receptors are localized to lipid rafts in the cavioli. Um, there can be a selective affinity for some of these uh, proteins. And, and also, lipids can be, uh, be found in, uh, in, these, in these rafts. And so, if you think about it, um, you know, certain membranes uh, need a lot of uh, specific lipids uh, or need a lot of proteins, depending on the, on the membrane that you're uh, thinking about. So, uh, so, the plasma membrane is really this patchy environment, locally differentiated into these, into these different domains. And uh, some uh, some of these membranes have a lot of lipid and very little protein. So um, uh, I guess I briefly talked about myelin, right? myelin and sheathing the axons. Well, this myelin uh, doesn't need a lot of proteins because it's basically just there to form a lipid uh, or a, a sheath around the axon. So there the, uh, the, 
protein content might be fairly low, but you might have some other uh, some other uh, membranes, uh, mitochondrial membranes, for example, that have many more uh, proteins in them. So in either case, the membrane is this fluid two-dimensional environment, and these rafts are clustered lipids and proteins that are basically floating uh, together, and this is sort of what it can look like. So here's one of those lipid rafts. You can see there's a lot of uh, cholesterol that has been built into this particular lipid raft. Uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, glycoproteins and you have a lot of glycolipids. And so these lipid rafts are essentially a communication hub, a communication hub uh, for anything to either communicate with the inside of the cell or to actually get uh, into the inside of the cell. All right, any questions? No questions? All right. All right, well, uh, in the case, I see you again tomorrow. I'll be lecturing again.